morning, everyone. It's so great to have you here. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to have such a big crowd joining us. We're so grateful. If you raise your hand if this is the first time you've been to one of our events. Welcome. It's wonderful to have so many first timers. And my name is David Murphy. I'm with TechFire. And uh, so honored to partner with the city to uh, bring together an incredible lineup of, of speakers today. We're so honored to have uh, all of our speakers joining us. And you know, I think it really speaks to, no pun intended, the uh, exciting things that are happening in Burbank here. You know, uh, we all see in this beautiful room here, the beautiful view, uh, the city around us, I and mean, what a spectacular place. You know, and if you are someone who uh, is a founder, raise your hand if you're a founder. Uh, very cool, good to have entrepreneurs with us. And you know, you're thinking about where to bring your tech startup. You know, I hope that you will start it up in Burbank. Uh, exciting things uh, have been happening in Burbank uh, for so long. The magic of the entertainment industry, it's gonna be a big part of our theme today. But if you are a media or entertainment startup, or if you're a healthcare startup, or just any startup in between, this is a really magical place where I do hope you will bring your company. So whether you're on the founding side or you're just here to hear uh, you know, the future of healthcare, future of entertainment from our panelists, welcome, thank you for coming. I'm gonna give a little bit more of an introduction to the program in just a minute, but before any further, I just wanna bring up to the stage uh, uh, the leader of the Community Development Department from the city of Burbank, Patrick Prescott. Please give him a very warm welcome. Good morning. Um, you can tell I work for government because I assumed there would be a podium here and I would be able to make a very formal presentation. So I'm going to hold the mic and read from my notes here. So good morning and welcome. Welcome to Burbank. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Burbank. We do everything from code enforcement, Section 8 housing, economic development, who arranged this event here today, uh, planning uh, and development, building inspection, etc. So it's a, it's a lot we take on and uh, this is uh, one of the more fun and exciting components of our department. So I'm excited to have all of you here today. Based on the success and feedback from the last Tech Summit, we're happy to bring you back for another opportunity to discuss the future of technology, entertainment, and healthcare. Simple, right? Uh, someone said, "So why healthcare?" And I'm and I'm looking uh, why why healthcare? And I'm looking forward to hearing that connection. Right? I think that'll be really interesting. Um, Burbank is a city with many opportunities and many jobs. Uh, Burbank has 150,000 jobs. Uh, uh, a city with 150,000 jobs typically has a po resident population of about 300,000. Ours is 108,000. So 108,000 people sleep in Burbank. Uh, and uh, our daytime population rises to 200,000 people. Uh, so when we're planning for a community, we're planning for more than just the, the folks who sleep here. Uh, obviously, our biggest uh, industry is uh, entertainment, right? Uh, but don't forget healthcare, so I'm glad we're gonna talk about that. Um, we have many com vibrant commercial districts, including the one we're all sitting in right now, which is the media district. Uh, we have our downtown district, um, where the uh, old and new IKEA are located, as well as our downtown village, the airport, the evolving airport district, where a new airport terminal will be constructed in the next uh, five to six years, uh, as well as our wonderful tree-lined Magnolia Park neighborhood. But we don't take our success for granted, and we definitely don't take the businesses here in Burbank for granted. Um, we want to ensure that we can do what we can to help make business successful in Burbank. Uh, sometimes that's by actively partnering with businesses, and sometimes that's just by getting out of your way and letting you be successful. Um, so, as much as we value our entertainment and technology sectors, as I mentioned, we're always looking for ways to diversify our economy. You know, you never want to put all your eggs in one basket. And when Lockheed went away, the aerospace industry went away, uh, we were fortunate enough that the entertainment industry grew or had, was growing at the time to fill that void. So we're always wondering what's next, you know? So um, for those of you who are joining us from across the LA region, uh, some of you may be for the first time in Burbank. I know that may sound surprising to some others here, but it's possible, right? Uh, I just want to encourage you after today's event to stick around a little while. Maybe get lunch here in the, since you're already paid for parking, uh, get, uh, 
get lunch here uh, along Riverside Drive. There's lots of restaurants, or take a little drive up to Magnolia Park, just right up Hollywood Way. And I think if you haven't seen it before, you'll, you'll be quite impressed. Um, also, besides considering staying here for a few minutes after today's event, think of Burbank when you're thinking about where to launch your next business venture. Uh, thanks again for coming. I hope you enjoy this event uh, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you so much to the city. You know, this event would not be happening at all without the city of Burbank. And isn't it something when you think about it? You know, you're an entrepreneur. So often you, you maybe complain about red tape or whatever out there in government. But, you know, here we are with the government actually rolling out the red carpet for all of us. A big thank you to all of our sponsors. You know, we're so grateful. I'm sure all of you have stopped by their tables uh, as the morning began. But if you didn't, uh, you know, thank you to One Burbank, to the City of Glendale, to Providence St. Joseph Medical Center, and to UCLA Health for making this event possible. We're so grateful. How about a big thank you to all of them? And thank you again, as Patrick mentioned, to our city council members and uh, Ron Davis and Justin and all the city leaders that make this such a great place not only to work and start your company, but also to live. So, um, you know, what is it on that note of, that makes Burbank such a magical place? It's not just the fact that when you go get lunch on Riverside Drive, as Patrick was saying, you might run into a mentor from Disney or Warner Brothers who will help advise your startup. It's also the fact, you know, in the very uh, you know, bottom line level, there's no city income tax, there's no gross sales receipt tax, you know. Uh, I mean, these things matter when you're on ramen noodle budgets. Uh, so give it, give it some serious thought, uh, you know, uh, as you're thinking about where to start your company. So without any further ado, I'd, I'd like to uh, move us on to the, the main part of our program here. I want to give us a few extra minutes uh, with our keynote speaker, given how excited I know I am, and I'm sure all of you are, to hear from him. Um, and just to, just to step back a moment, uh, you know, we're in Burbank, right? Uh, we're in the media and entertainment capital of the world. And isn't it perfect then that we would be thinking about the future of entertainment? We just had the Oscars, and who watched? Everyone, right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it was all the glamour and all the glitz. Well, it's also, you know, of course, a big business. And we'll hear later in the day about some of the other components of the entertainment industry gaming and, and music as well in our panel there. But to kick things off, we have one of the true uh, big thinkers in the entire entertainment industry, someone who's worked for 20th Century Fox as a, as a futurist and now is the futurist at Paramount Pictures, someone who's been on the uh, technology side of the entertainment industry, uh, leading on the side of you know virtual reality and augmented reality and used to be known as, as Ted from Red. And he, uh, Red camera aficionados here. Well, uh, you know, you'll hear more about his background as he as he, he speaks. But these days, he's advising the very senior leadership at Paramount and Viacom about what the future will be. And aren't we lucky to have him advising all of us on what this future of entertainment will be? So, without any further ado, won't you please give a very very warm welcome to futurists and residents at Paramount Pictures. Ted Shulowitz. I'm going to make a little futurist prediction. I'm going to predict that every one of you here, it's 100% saturation, has a little pocket robot with you. Um, you might call it a smartphone, yes? If you have one of those, take it out and hold it up. You have one, yes? Go get it. You need it. So hold it up nice and high, let's see. Yes, everybody's got one? Anybody not got one? Okay, no, keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Okay, next step, swap it with your neighbor. No, no, you're, no, you're doing me. No, no, oh, oh, okay, then I need somebody else. I need someone else to do me. You can do me. Here we go. You got mine, I got yours. All right. Now, everybody did it? Now take that new little pocket robot and put it in your pocket. Okay, how are we feeling? A little nervous? A little insecure? See how long you can hold out. Don't worry, you'll get it back. I, I need to get the little clicker or else that's the end of the presentation. Sorry. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, so 
We're going to talk about some interesting things today. We're going to talk about really who we are as people and what the hell is going on with us. So, as you no longer have that little thing that connects you to everything, I want you to reflect a little bit on what it feels like and what is actually going on with us. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Let's just imagine, because this looks like a little bit of a surly group, let's just imagine that some of us ended up in prison tonight, right? Now think about it. You no longer have that little robot that has all those phone numbers. They've taken it away from you, right? So who are you going to call, right? Maybe you know your wife or your significant other's phone number, maybe. And maybe you know your phone number from your family home when you grew up, but beyond that, if you don't have the robot, you've given up, right? You've given control over, and now you're in trouble. So your heart gets a little racy. So I came from the west side today this morning. Everybody probably came from someplace else to get here, unless you live in this building, right? And you probably need some kind of navigation to get here, right? Now think about how often you use the navigational tools in your little robot, and how often you have completely given up control because you don't really know how to get anywhere without it anymore, right? Even places you know how to get to, you ask your robot, which way, how should I do it, what's the best traffic pattern? There are, of course, benefits to this, right? But there's also, you have to have sort of an awareness of what's going on, of what's actually happening. We are using technology more and more and more and more intimate ways, and we are connected to it in deeper and deeper ways. So it's just something to sort of be aware of. So I like this quote a lot. If you guys are working in the tech sector, the innovation sector, um, it's a pretty valuable quote. Even if you're on the right track, you will get run over if you just sit there. And that's what sort of I do as a stock and trade of somebody that calls themselves a futurist. I have to think about where things are headed. And really all I tell people is, even if you're on the right track, you know what entertainment feels like. You know what social feels like. You know what healthcare feels like. You know what business to business feels like. But if you just sit there and just assume that everything is going to be the same, you're going to get run over really, really fast. So I'm going to give you some examples of what that means, what has happened, and how to maybe respond to it. So far, so good? How's, how's it feeling without the phone? Not good, right? I know. But it's all right. You'll get used to it. Don't worry. You'll get it back. Okay, so let's take a look at these statistics here a little bit. Let me step off side so you can read them. Think about who you are. Most people check little robots 150 times a day on average. That's every six minutes of your waking hour. Think about it. You probably do that. Young adults are now sending an average of 110 texts a day. I know kids that are sending way more than 110 today. Almost 50% of smartphone users say it's something they simply could not live without now, as you are all feeling, because it's just two feet away from you and you're stressed out about it. There was a study that said a clear majority of students, when they studied this, were in extreme distress when they tried to go out without their devices for a day. Try and think about the last time you spent an entire day without tapping on your smartphone. Can you even remember? Probably not, right? This last one's kind of interesting, too. It's a real statistic, right? They did research. People would rather give up sex than their smartphones. Nope. Well, you know, we're learning, right? So now I'm going to talk about something that I like to call the 10-year curve. So people think innovation happens quickly. Innovation does not happen quickly. Innovation happens over time with spikes of moments of inspiration and then effective execution and effective dynamic humanity change, how we change as people as technology moves along its curve. So I've often found, and if you think about it and reflect about it, that this very, very often refers to a 10-year period of time from when you can look at one part of where we were and how we lived and the things we did to 10 years later and what happened. So here's some interesting examples. Let's look at television. Historical television. A lot of you, Burbank, you work in the television business, as I'm told, right? Who works in the television business here? Yeah, all right, some of you work in the television business. There's lots of big movie studios right around here that work in the television. I work in a big movie studio in Hollywood. Look at these statistics. So here's a 10-year curve. In the 1950s, less than 10% of the people in the United States had this thing called a television. 
Within 10 years, you got from less than 10% to almost 90%. So no one had one, then almost everyone had one. In another 10-ish years, you had close to every single person you knew, and all of them that they knew had a television. So can you think about it? When was the last time you were in a house without a television? It's hard to kind of imagine, right? But it's a little hard to read with the light. It's a beautiful view, by the way, so I'm giving up the, uh, the projector for the view. Um, that says, can you imagine a living room where you don't need a television? Can anybody imagine that? Do you know that that's coming? That the devices, the physicality of the devices that we use today is really, really, really starting to change. And I will emphasize the word starting. So we're kind of like in the 1950s, in the age when we're going to remove the physicality of things. This projector, interesting, is kind of the beginnings of removing, removing physicality. I've got this giant sort of image that comes out of that little tiny box right there. That's not bad. It's not super bright, but this is a leading indicator of where we're headed with this stuff. All right, here's the next example. Everybody knows this company, right? Did you know that roughly 10 years ago, I started giving this speech about two years ago, so it was actually 10 years. Now it's about 12 years ago. This was the first YouTube video. The cool thing about these guys is that, is that they have really, really, really long um, fronts, and that's, that's cool. And that's pretty much all there is to say. That was the first YouTube video. It was my day at the zoo. These two kids went to San Diego. They are quite wealthy now, right? So that was the first YouTube video. A year later, a year later, it says one year, I think you're maybe, someone's blocking the thing, that's okay. One year later, Google acquired them. So Google had a little sense that maybe this is gonna be something, right? For $1.65 billion, from my day at the zoo to one year later, $1.65 billion. Here's some interesting statistics. Roughly 10 years later, here we go, ready? YouTube has a billion users. Almost a third of the people on the internet every day watch YouTube. A billion hours of video a day they're watching. YouTube has, YouTube has 88 countries working, 76 languages working, that covers almost the entire planet, right? 300 hours of video uploaded every minute. 10 years ago, my day at the zoo. <laughs> 10 years later, the top 100 videos on YouTube have exceeded a billion views. 20 of them are 2 billion, 4 of them are 3 billion, and one of them now has 4 billion. Anybody know what the 4 billion one is? Oh, you know it, trust me. It's that song, Despacito. <laughs> That's it, 4 billion views. Anybody here have a Netflix subscription? Yeah, a good amount of you, right? So, you all know this term, Netflix and chill? That refers to different things than if you're a teenager or an adult. But we all do it in some way, shape, or form. Okay, it didn't happen overnight. Here's another thing we're gonna look at. It actually has a couple of 10-year curves. In 1997, two guys founded it. And they decided to call it Netflix. 10 years later, they delivered a billion, well, one billion DVD. That's 10 years. And they decide that they're going to do something called streaming. But interestingly enough, when they started in 1997, they didn't call it Mailflix. They called it Netflix, right? Even though they were mailing all of the entertainment. But someone had the insight that at some point, we don't have to mail it. At some point, it will become virtual. At some point, we can remove the physicality, which is kind of interesting. Now, today, We've gone from starting in someone's apartment to 100 million worldwide subscribers, and maybe in a couple years it'll be 200 million, which is why you buy stock in Netflix. 10 years. One, two, three, right? I wonder what's going to happen here. Oh, yeah, let's talk about this. You guys remember this? Anybody old enough to do this? Yeah? Netscape. Netscape. 1995. They had their IPO, and they sort of marked the, what we call the birth of the internet, the customer internet, the consumer internet. Anybody remember this? CompuServe, right? So at its peak, this is interesting, this is going to sort of translate a little later in time. In the mid-90s, 
CompuServe hit peak, subscri peak subscribers at 3.6 million humans. We all think, oh yeah, everybody used CompuServe, but only three million people on the planet actually used CompuServe. But it was in our mindset. But this set the stage for interesting things that have happened 10 years later and 10 years later. Oh yeah, everybody remember that, right? So we went from CompuServe with a few million to then like a lot of people had AOL, hundreds of millions, right? And in 1997, about half of all US homes with internet that was like plug-in <laughs> internet, remember that? Had AOL. In 2000, AOL was the largest internet service provider in the world. Who still uses AOL here, anybody? One person, that's about right. <laughs> On average, in a crowd of about 200 people, you get one person that still has an AOL account. Over the course of 10 years, right? Things changed. Then we all know this, right? I need to get a higher resolution of that version, but that's okay. It's kind of funny to see it's so low res. Read that. Okay? Not all that long ago, Google was started in 1995, or maybe 1997, 97. Oh yeah. Founded about 13 years ago, right? And now you've got 1.4 people on Facebook. Oh yeah. Everybody use this? Here's some great statistics. Because I'm an Apple guy. I was actually looking around my house at all the Apple stuff that I have, and it's shocking, because I never throw any of it away. Because even though I don't use any of it, it still holds a very important place in my heart. So, and I bet a lot of you are like that too. Why is Apple so successful? Because on average, every American household in the United States reports owning 2.6 Apple products. Wow, right? And yeah, they make a lot of money doing that. So they're kind of good. All started from something. Now here's the something. Here's what's interesting to me. The something is, all, oh you can sit down sir, I, I, I'm keeping you up there and I forgot. Uh, whose phone do you have? Oh you have her phone. Well maybe you should sit right there then, because you never know. <laughs> okay. So the thing that I think is really interesting, and for all of you that have come to this business conference because you want to sort of learn and feel what it's like to innovate, and you want to kind of get into the spirit of that, none of those giant companies that I mentioned, I didn't even bring up Amazon, but that's another big success, started out with like these grand aspirations that they were going to be this gigantic company, right? They just started out because they had a problem to solve, and they wanted to do something in a new way, and they wanted to try something new. So our friends at Microsoft, right? The birthplace of Silicon Valley. Our friend right here in Burbank, Walt Disney, literally started his company in that little garage behind his mom's house. Literally, right? All of our friends at Apple, at Google, our friend, those were their houses. That's really where these companies started. So if you think about what it means to innovate, you can't think about what am I going to be when I'm going to rule the world. You have to just think about what am I going to be when I'm going to rule the neighborhood for the next two seconds and see where it goes. And this is kind of a favorite little moment from a show. This is where it all began, gentlemen. The birthplace of Huli. Peter Gregory's mother's garage. That was Peter's workstation. This was mine. Things sure have changed. But in a way, they've stayed exactly the same. As we forge our new path together, we must remain focused on what's really important. Not material success or wealth, but this. The spirit of innovation. A few coders, some ramen, and a dream. And that is why I brought you here. All right, let me show you the rest of the place. Oh, oh. you got a garage inside your garage. Impressive. His garage inside his garage. So that's from a show called Silicon Valley. Anybody watch Silicon Valley? When I watch it, it's like watching a documentary for me. It's not, because I know every single like archetypal person in that show. I know real person. That's kind of what I do all day. But this is valuable to sort of reflect on, even though it's comical. So just sort of worth thinking. Okay. So after that little introduction, I often get this question. I often get like, so you're a futurist? Like, how do you become a futurist? What gives me the right to stand up on this little astroturf? And how come you guys aren't up here standing on this little astroturf, right? 
So I had to answer this in front of a crowd like this, and it sort of dawned on me one day that I think I know how this happened. So I grew up here. More specifically, I grew up here. This place is a place I call the funnel of crazy, because everything, both good and bad, and unfortunately just recently we've had some more bad things that go, but all the crazy that lives up in North America kind of all works its way, and when it's really crazy, it starts to find its way down to Florida. So when you hear a news story that starts off with, and on this unusual little nugget, you're kind of like, oh yeah, I know where this is going. <laughs> and it's going to be in Florida. So I grew up in a place called Central Florida. When I was a little kid, my parents moved me down to this place called Central Florida. This is what I grew up in. It was orange groves, it was agricultural, it was pretty racist, it was pretty scary for to sort of drop into this place. But a year later, one year later after we moved here, this is what my world turned into. Well, Disney, that guy with that little garage about 10 minutes ago, decided to plant his new stakes in Orlando. He could have a little more land to work with. And I literally grew up in a world where change was embraced, where ideas were temporary, where things were going to always evolve. And there were really good sort of visual examples of that all around this world that I lived in. So I worked there and I spent a lot of time there and I literally grew up in the world of the future. I grew up in a place where change was the norm, where things were going to change all the time and that happened at a very young age for me. So that just, I became very comfortable with the idea of things changing. Where a lot of people are not comfortable with things changing, it was the opposite for me. So later in life, um, after I was done sort of working and doing all these interesting things, I got this job at Fox to be a futurist at a movie studio. I worked on all these interesting VR experiences and helped build this thing called the Fox Innovation Lab. And now, oh, and then I, I built this stuff. Um, I helped build these things. So I was on these teams that sort of worked with Apple to create all of these interesting things that were considered futuristic at the time, but then became very normalized. Um, and that was my background. That was kind of what led me into sort of dropping into the movie studio world. So that's what I worked on. And now I work here. I'm a little, little promo. And it's awesome. It's a historical place. It's got a hundred years of wonderful movie making. And it's my job to kind of inch them along. To just say, all right, I'm, I'm sort of a diplomatic emissary is really what it comes down to. I'm always talking to the people that run the studio and work on all these movies and all these different things, and I'm saying, you know if you don't experiment, you're gonna miss it. You know if you don't innovate, you're gonna miss it. So do you really wanna get Netflix again, or do you wanna be on the other side of this? And it's the kind of great unknown, it's like the living in the what if that gives people a lot of angst. But some of us feel much better when we know things are gonna change, and I just happen to be one of those. So that's where I work now. I like this. Uh, it'd be great if we can make this a little louder. Do we think we can, or is that we at max? Those who think getting a car phone is not for them, whatever the reason, haven't kept up with the booming industry of cellular radio telephones. Scenes like this are becoming commonplace in U.S. cities where cellular is available today. This revolution in communications could make it possible for more and more people to have a phone in their car, or even one that travels with you. Like this unique cellular portable made by Motorola, which weighs only 30 ounces. Right now, businessmen and women are major users of radio telephones where cellular is in service. But more people will take advantage of cellular as its benefits become apparent. Eventually, seeing people using cellular phones may seem as commonplace as someone checking time on an electronic watch, figuring on an electronic calculator, or programming on an electronic computer. Industry watchers say there are only a few thousand cellular phones in use right now, but that number is expected to grow considerably within the next few years during the cellular revolution. Okay. So, here's what's interesting about that. So as you watch that video, and then I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this picture. So essentially what we have done as a society and a technology is we've been trying to achieve an objective. And that objective is, how do we minimize the compute power? How do we, not, not minimize the power of the compute power, but minimize the physicality of the compute power and maximize the physicality of the thing we call the screen, okay? So essentially we're trying to shrink 
the compute power, not shrink the actual power, but shrink the package it comes in. Oops. Let's see if that works right. And maybe it didn't work right. Grow the screen size. So if you look at your device today, or your friend's device that you have, it's essentially all screen, right? Whereas the earliest cell phones were all compute packaged with a little, little tiny screen. But what we kept realizing is that we really like the screen. We want more screen. We need more screen to do stuff, which is kind of, so that's kind of the evolution of what cell phones have looked like. And now here we are today, right? Ten-year curve. Google launched, I mean, Apple launched the first iPhone ten years ago. That's part of the ten-year curve. Two years ago, they sold their one billionth of those little devices that you have here. Who has, who has Apple versus who has Android? So about 75% who has Android? Yeah, that's about what it normally is, about 75, 25 in the West. Um, Google bought in 2005 Android, and now there are two billion devices running worldwide on Android in the world. So those are interesting things to think about. And the stuff I think about a lot is form and formulation. So over time, we've shrunk the compute package, we've increased the size, and we've changed the formulation, right? So the question is, we pretty much those stayed the same. We pretty much made these little rectangles or squares that have a border around them. And we hold them and use them and put them in places, right? Like my laptop has a border there. This has a border, right? So like, what's next? This is kind of interesting because this is part of the story of what's next. This is not the end of the story by any stretch of the imagination. But what's most important about these devices as they stand now is that they are increasing the concept of the screen. They are allowing you to give a belief structure that even though the screen that's inside these devices is about the same size as the screen on your iPhone or your Android phone, you get the belief structure that this screen is enormous. That it is as big as you want it to be because it can track. We can move the screen now along with our brains and our bodies. So if you think about all of this technology, doing is we're making magic tricks, right? These are just illusions. And these devices allow for better illusions. But I call these BOF. BOF to me stands for box on face. That's what these things are. They're, that's not a criticism, by the way. That's just kind of where we are in the curve. They're a little clunky. They're a little heavy. The resolution's not high enough. But the experience into this stuff, like I do, can be remarkable and incredible. So look at the numbers, right? And remember those days when I brought up the number of CompuServe with about 3.6 million of those people using them? We're kind of in the CompuServe days. I think I kind of represent that. We're sort of in the Netflix CompuServe days of VR, which if you believe what I believe, and you know that the Google, Apple, Facebook days are coming, then you better pay attention to this stuff. And you better learn what these do and what their limitations are and what their strengths are, or else you're going to miss it, right? So you want to get involved in all this stuff. And there's all kinds of statistics online, but there's like in the low number of millions of these things being sold around the world, which is a valuable thing to think about. So in a few minutes, we're going to ask, is there something beyond the box on the face? I believe there is, and I'm going to tell you what I think it is or where I think it's going. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about something that I just want you to reflect on. It's the, what I call the path to greatness. So if you look at all these movies, and you could probably think of many more, we would probably collectively all say, these are great movies. These are iconic. These are things that stand the test of time. Yes? Anybody disagree? No. When we look at television, we would say, these are great. These are fantastic shows. Is Breaking Bad in there somewhere? Yeah. And The West Wing, and MASH, if you're old enough to know, like, on the family. These are things that created greatness, that really understood the art form and sort of built on the wonder of the art form and gathered huge audiences and became very important, right? In the interactive world, I don't know if you guys are play games at all, but these are sort of the steps to greatness, right? You had Pong, you had Pac-Man, you had Super Mario, and these days, all of my kids and all your kids are playing this kind of stuff. These things make way more money than movies, by the way, now. And these have what we would define, if you play in this world, greatness. These are great. Now, in the world of virtual reality and augmented reality, there is no great yet, which is interesting. There's a lot of good. I'm going to show you a lot of good. 
These are the things that I think are good, that I think everybody should watch. Now, when I brought up all those movies, you've probably seen every one of those movies, right? When I brought up all those TV shows, you've probably seen every one of those TV shows. If you're a gamer, and I brought up all those video games, you've probably played every one of those games for hours and hours and hours and hours. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Out of all these things, some of you may be with me, who has spent hours and hours and hours playing every single one of these things? Anybody in this room? Nobody's raising their hand. Interesting. So, part of the curve, part of the learning, is you've got to get time under the hood. If you're curious about this business, this industry we call virtual reality, and you didn't raise your hand and say, yes, I've seen every single one of these and I've spent hours playing every single one of these, you are not ready yet. You have huge blind spots. You know what television is. You know what good TV is and bad TV is and neutral TV is. You know what movies are. But if you don't do enough of this, you have no idea what virtual reality can do. So if you're interested in this world, if you're interested in the world of the future, and this is a big part of the future, you got to get yourself into this stuff. You've got to figure out a way to do this at least as much as you watch a tenth of the TV that you watch now. And then you'll start to remove your blind spots. This is just an example of where things sit. So I can tell you afterwards how much it costs to get into this. It's not that expensive anymore. And if you want to be in this business, it's time to go play. It's time to go learn what this stuff's all about. That's my sort of inspirational Tony Robbins movie. I have a question for your stuff. Shall we do questions now or after? Are we okay on time? A little longer. Okay, five minutes more and then maybe we can do a couple questions. So this stuff has not been the first time around the bend for VR. If you look at this, where is it? 1995, we tried it, right? And it didn't really catch on because it was like millions and millions of dollars to get VR on your face. But now that's all changed. This is a really big moment. Anybody here play the Nintendo Wii? So that's virtualized entertainment because you, weren't, you didn't have a controller, you were simulating real things in the fake world. You could give grandma a bowling ball and let her bowl in the living room. You could play tennis in the living room. This was the beginnings of what it started to be for the home. This was virtual entertainment for the home, but we still watched it on a screen, on a traditional screen. This was step one. Step two was think started to understand how to virtualize their entertainment. They didn't need to bring physical roller coasters anymore or physical rides. They could put you in ride vehicles and give you the kind of stimulation, visually, auditory, physically, that would make you believe something's happening. Nowadays, guess what? We can take a theme park and we can put it on our face. We can literally wear a theme park on our face. And there's a whole little industry that's come out of that we call location-based entertainment. That's what this looks like. And you basically wear these backpack PCs, and you put on a VR headset, and you go to a place like a theme park, and you go to the experience. So this is like what you wear. It's a little hard to see in the, in the light, but this is this big backpack. It's literally a PC that you have to wear on your back. That's kind of a problem, right? So that's got to be But we're solving that. So we still got the box on the face sort of thing, right? We still got all this stuff. But these guys are going to be fully wireless. They actually remove the backpack and they allow you to just take the whole computing thing and put it up in your face. So it goes from there. This is the backpack. And then we shrink the backpack and we literally put the backpack inside the headset. And that's what, that's not 10 years away. That's a year or two away. And that's when everybody's going to want one of these things. Or sort of everybody. It's still a box on the face. But we're getting there. Okay, so that's virtual reality. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about augmented reality and wrap up. So augmented or mixed reality allows you to blend the real world and the artificial world. Whereas virtual reality is an artificial world. You are literally occluding everything. You can't see anything except what's in the box, right? So there's all kinds of examples. If you don't have AR kit downloaded on your iPhone or don't have um, um, AR Core downloaded on your Google phone, you should do that and you should download some things and see what it is. It's what we call magic window experiences where you can put things like crabs and stuff and sort of use your phone as a window to add entertainment, which is the beginnings of something. Again, not the end of something. This is where I think it gets sort of interesting. This is a clip that kind of went viral in our world like, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. So remember that movie, The Ring? 
Now what happens when, like, she really comes out of the TV? It's pretty scary. That's storytelling, right? And that's a real thing. You can download that and, like, do that today. Okay, the rumor mill. So I talked about my love for Apple. This is in no way, shape, or form telling you what's coming. This is just what people are making up, what they think is going to happen. So just kind of look at this, because often these things do sort of predict where things are going. And it's worth kind of spending time in the rumor mill. Because Apple's probably working on something. Nobody knows, but they probably are. And when they do, it's probably going to be great. This is an interesting little company called Magic Leap. Anybody heard of Magic Leap down in Florida? They raised $2 billion in capital. They don't really have a product yet they're showing to anybody. They have close to an $8 billion valuation. That's innovation for you. This is a little promo video that's completely artificial. This is not real, but this is what they're working on. You're like, yeah, that's not gonna happen. Guess what? That happens. Like, I go to Magic Leap all the time. I'm working with these guys. This is what they're doing. You do have to wear something, but these kinds of things, this mixed reality world, is really, really happening. So, this is another device called the HoloLens. They're working on a next-gen HoloLens now, which is on a similar path to that. This is real video, captured of what you can do today. This is a real device. You can buy it for $3,000. It's a totally fully head-mounted computing system. And you can basically bring out all of those things that you use in your normal compute world and stick them in a virtual world that floats around your face. You can do that today. These are some of the interesting things that I think are really valuable in that thing. There's, you want to talk about less and less and less. There's less VR stuff that's really good. There's almost no AR stuff that's really good. There's two that I would point to. So if you can get access to a HoloLens, play a game called Fragments, you'll live inside a crime novel, and play a game called Young Conquer, which is like an augmented reality version of Super Mario. And they're great fun. So I do this I play with this stuff a lot. That's what the Magic Leap's gonna look like. This was totally secret for up until about a few months ago. It's kind of a steampunk sort of thing. It's eyewear, it'll feel like glasses, a little heavier than glasses, and it uses a little external compute pack that you wear kind of like your cell phone, like you stuck in, you stick it in your pocket, there's no wire. That's what they're doing. That illusion of giving you, a, like, I could bring up a whale and it could be here, or an elephant, and you would wear these things and you would think it was standing right next to me. That's what you have to wear to do that today. And that's coming soon. So, as I wrap up, these are two little videos. This was the thing that Magic Leap made with Weta, you know the big VFX company, Weta? <laughs> um, to show what they would do in Magic Leap, and they got all kinds of flack for this, because this was artificial. This was just a CGI creation of what it would look like. So this is what it was. So if people watch this on YouTube, you can find it, and people would come to me and they'd be like, yeah, that's not real, right? There's no way they're actually doing that. Because like, I know that Weta made that. Like, it's just a fake thing. And I would say, okay, here's the difference between you and me. I've actually been there, and that's exactly what they're doing. Like, that's really what's happening. And people were like, yeah, I don't believe it. And no one else believed it either. So about a year later, my little friends in Magic said, you know what, maybe we should actually kind of show people what we really are doing. So they took this video, you can find it on YouTube, they took this video and they just shot it through those glasses, where at the time weren't little glasses, they were this big giant experimental thing. This is what it really looks like. So this is like real stuff. That's not quite as sexy as the Weta thing, but you kind of get a sense that you can start to bring the world and wear your computing system. You don't have to carry it, you don't have to put it in your pocket anymore. You can just wear it. So there'll be a day, in the somewhat near future, where you'll leave your cell phone at home, your smartphone, and you won't have a holy shit moment at all. Because you'll just have something better. You'll be like, oh, I'm good, I don't need it anymore, it's just in the drawer. And that's what's gonna happen. That's the next thing in the process. This is a current little clip that they just released. It's so much better if you can actually go and look online. But you can find this, this is just look like latest Magic Leap demo. This is a, like this artistic rendering thing that they're doing in Iceland. This is literally showing through the headset. I've been there to see this thing. It's remarkable. Um, and these are some of the things that they're building. Okay, so as we wrap up, I'm gonna wrap up now. So this is just what I wanna leave you with. These little words of maybe wisdom or insanity or somewhere in the middle. Now, everybody take your phone back, swap them back.
Whose phone do I have? How does it feel? Kind of, it's kind of refreshing, right? For a little bit, to take a little break from the data dump, right? There we go. And invariably, someone forgets, and they have a really bad day later. So. <laughs> be bold, be brave, take some risks. Be willing to explore the edges. That's what I do all day long. That's what I wanted to show you in all these slides. None of that stuff is mainstream yet. It's starting to get mainstream. It's the soft, gushy part around where it's a little, the footing's a little unsure, that's where you really get the cool stuff, where you figure it out. When it gets to the center, it's like kind of all hardened up, and you kind of, it's already done. So if you're interested in innovation, you gotta get out to the edges. So that's what I want to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted. That was awesome. Uh, and you know, now we're going to switch to another field, and it's actually one where I assure you you won't have to exchange your, your cell phone. Actually, you can't because we have to worry about HIPAA protections in this market, the healthcare industry, uh, and uh, privacy uh, is, is key there. So in, in all seriousness, uh, we're going to get the stage set up here in just a moment, and I want to set up the theme for a moment. You know, uh, you think about uh, the healthcare, and you know, we were talking earlier actually about you know, how does this fit into the, the tech theme? Well, actually, you know, you think about how startups want to change the world, right? Uh, you know, imagine, uh, you know, actually having <laughs> not just a little impact with a game, right, uh, on people's lives, but actually saving lives. You know, that's what healthcare startups have the potential to do. I mean, talk about changing the world. It's uh, something that we all know is so crucially important, but I think we all know, even those of us not in the industry, uh, just how hard it is. I mean, whether it's the HIPAA protections, it's the, uh, the you know, the, the nature of healthcare in this country. What a challenging thing it is to navigate that world as a healthcare startup. And so what we're gonna do is get uh, some panelists uh, from the perspective of startups in the healthcare world, from the perspective of growth companies in the startup world and healthcare, and then also from the provider side. Uh, and, you know, really get a, a big uh, perspective across the issues here. We could obviously go into so much more. We'll try not to get too political here, though. Uh, it's still early in the morning. But without any further ado, I'd like to welcome up to the stage our panelists for the healthcare panel. If you could come up on stage here, we're going to get going. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup of folks who've come in, and, and uh, please don't be shy right here. Uh, uh, come in all the way from uh, uh, Quite, uh, quite far away from Denny here on the end, drove him from Ventura, very heroic. Uh, uh, and uh, we have some local folks just down the street as well. And what I'd like to do first is just uh, have a chance to give a warm welcome to our panelists. Won't you join me? And I'm gonna uh, let everyone introduce themselves, uh, starting with you, Matt, if you could tell us a little about your background. Sure. Hi guys, is this on? Can you hear me all right? Uh, I'm Matt Kozlov. I uh, work at Techstars, which is a global network that helps entrepreneurs succeed around the world. Uh, we run 40 accelerators, um, literally in almost every major city you can imagine, and at this point in most uh, industries you can imagine. Uh, our vertical programs we run usually in partnership with a major corporation that's committed to supporting entrepreneurs and driving innovation. Uh, and for the last two years and change, I ran the uh, Cedar sinai Accelerator in partnership with Techstars, which is our healthcare program. Uh, and I, we've, we've run that program three times. We've invested in over 28 uh, provider-focused healthcare tech companies. Uh, and now I'm working on building a new vertical program here in Los Angeles in a, another highly regulated, really interesting industry, uh, which we haven't made public yet. but. Um, I look forward to it. We have a reporter in the audience from Tech TechCrunch, so watch out yeah. what you say here. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Michael Lazarus. I am the uh, physician director of the UCLA Hospitalist Service, and usually I have to explain what a hospitalist is. It's not quite as fancy as a futurist, but it does end in IST. Uh, in medicine, when a physician specializes in a certain area, they get whatever that area is. So a hospitalist is a physician that works in the hospital, and UCLA has been growing that uh, side of our care provision. We now have about 19 hospitals where we can get a UCLA faculty hospital to take care of you. So that's about it. Uh, good morning. I'm Kelly.
and I'm the Chief Executive at Providence St. Joseph Medical Center here in Burbank. I've been in uh, healthcare for some 30 years and not-for-profit healthcare and Catholic healthcare for the last six years. Um, it's really a privilege to be a part of this today and uh, share with you some of the things that we're doing to move forward uh, into our future. My name is Matt Dinolfo. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, uh, I'm a physician. I'm the Vice Chair of Medicine uh, for the Department of Medicine at UCLA and uh, in charge of our uh, community uh, expansion uh, to Burbank and to various other areas, uh, which has been going on for about six years. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I practiced uh, internal medicine and infectious diseases at UCLA as well. My name is Denny Weinberg. I'm the CEO of a company called Hixme. We are a technology platform that helps large employers deconstruct their traditional health benefits program and replace it with one where each worker has personal ownership of a portable health benefit that they take with them through their life. Well, thank you all for coming. And, you know, what I'd like to do is just kick things off with a question for all of you. Uh, you know, when you think about the future of healthcare here in 2018, you know, we know there's so much uh, uncertainty. Uh, politically, there's so much, you know, so many challenges we still have, but let's start off on a positive note. What is it that most excites you about the future, whether it's the short term this year or it's the longer term? What, uh, you know, whether it's startups uh, or uh, developments, innovation, what is it that, that you really want to share with the audience that you're so excited about right now? And we'll start with you, Matt. Sure. I mean, from the investor perspective, I think you know there's been a lot of talk about the you know digitalization of healthcare and health 2.0 has been a word that's been floating around the industry for a long time. Um, and you know the first wave kind of went and passed, and not a lot of value was created because I think most investors were drawn to it without realizing that really it needs to make financial sense for the people controlling the budgets of healthcare, which is providers and payers and government entities. Um, but in the last couple of years, as things have shifted towards um, risk-based models, you see a lot more investment going into the industry and a lot more health systems such as Cedar sinai and I'm very eager to hear what some of the other health systems here in Southern California are doing, really eager to work with startups, which is something that I think they were reluctant to do uh, until recently. And so we've seen just a lot of growth and commercial traction for the companies that we've invested in, where I think that, you know, five, ten years ago that would have been really difficult. And just in the industry, you just saw the acquisition of Flatiron, which was a great success for digital health. Um, and you know, a lot of really other great uh, market indicators. So um, I, uh, I would say that healthcare is uh, at its full pace, so to speak, where your primary care doctor or your uh, ophthalmologist actually works is sort of moves at glacial speed with regards to change in innovation. So that is uh, very different to the first quarter where in the entertainment industry, innovation and technology, I don't know if any of you had the conversation with your primary care doctor about the medical record, the electronic medical record. It is a burden on most physicians' backs to the extent that all the physicians, maybe slightly older than my generation, are leaving the profession because the burden of the uh, uh, electronic charging is so, so great. So I don't want to sort of uh, say that that excites me most about the medicine. I will say that chair of medicine at UCSF and he wrote a book called The Digital Doctor if you're interested in seeing where healthcare in medicine is going and is right now uh, it's a good place to start but the thing that excited me most I think in the last few uh, months was the announcement that Amazon, JP Morgan and uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway had in started to get together to talk about how they could revolutionize healthcare because it is very difficult, it is poorly understood, Most, even us within the healthcare industry probably don't understand a lot of healthcare financing and, and cost payments, so it's going to be very interesting to see where that goes. There, there hasn't been a lot announced in terms of actual outcome, but the fact that they are talking about it I think is very um, very exciting and gives me hope for the future. 
So as a hospital administrator, I usually get, uh, get blamed for the health care, uh, for the uh, electronic health care record. Uh, but, um, you know, it really is um, exciting where we're going into our future. And I want to start with saying, as a, a hospital in Burbank, we're really focused on the community and, and focused on our local work. But as part of a large health system, we're really trying to look at what we're doing to advance health care, to change health care, and make sure that it's affordable and accessible to really everybody. And I think to your point about payment models and things is that we are invested in looking towards innovative, disruptive technologies to change healthcare, to provide better access to individuals within our communities so that we can better serve all of those who are in need. And so there's a lot of things going on right now, whether it be through the digitally enabled to support the caregivers, or whether it be to support our consumers uh, and employers. Uh, things like uh, virtual health, where you can go online and, and get it, see a provider immediately. Uh, things where we're actually having um, better uh, settings for uh, the care that we're providing to all of you. I think you all know it's very expensive to come to a hospital for services. And so we have to get care in the right place, in the right setting, and at the right price. Because if we don't do that, uh, we're, none of us will be successful. And so uh, I'm excited about the digital uh, enabled work that we're doing. Uh, we actually have a, a fund called the Provenance Fund, which is funding new disruptive innovative technologies, funding new ways to do things. And when we look at our oncology services and cancer care, um, we're using precision medicine, we're using uh, clinical decision support tools and things where we're doing molecular analysis, but then creating very personalized care for each and every one of you. And in doing that, we can look across these uh, national databases, we can find better resources and tools to support the individual needs that you all have. And so it's exciting to see where technology is taking some of this advancement in, in the care, health and care that we're providing. Uh, for me, I, I think the, the change in strategy for UCLA Health that started about six years ago when we started to go on the community is probably the most exciting because I've, I've been involved with it uh, since its onset. Um, up until that time, uh, UCLA Health was essentially a, a West Side uh, health system. Um, now we're bringing UCLA Health out to the very probably into Santa Barbara. Uh, we have a fairly large footprint, and, and in uh, July of last year, the health system leadership uh, essentially uh, you are going to use what we have developed as the overall strategy as we develop this health system and expand it uh, throughout Ventura County, LA County. Um, the Los Angeles market uh, is not a particularly consolidated market, but is becoming consolidated with uh, obviously very strong players, Providence being one of them, Kaiser's being one of them, and, and now I think UCLA Health being uh, another. Uh, and we, we are looking for partnerships, and, and we, we admit patients uh, into uh, Providence hospitals or across the Michael alluded to, uh, we have hospitalists and specialists in every one of these hospitals where six years ago it was two hospitals, now we have, I believe, 19 hospitals that we, we service. So it, it's expanding rel relatively rapidly, and that's a pretty exciting time for somebody like me who's, who's been you know, able to see medicine from you know, the, the 70s now into a, a time when it, the electronic medical record make this possible to be able to go online and, and to essentially pull up any record within the system and also any system that is also linked to a Zepic system that we use and which most academic centers use uh, and I believe Providence uses as well. Uh, it's just a phenomenal tool for us to be able to deliver care. Uh, this is an industry that uh, consumes uh, three trillion dollars a year. It's projected that by 2026 20 percent of the gross national product of our country will be consumed by healthcare. It is the most backwards um, industry um, in the United States for sure relative to technology deployment for efficiency purposes. I'm excited about this because of two dynamics. One, the pain level associated with financing healthcare is widespread and, and, it, is, and it is deep. It's deep-seated with employers, it's deep-seated with consumers, it's deep-seated with providers of healthcare, all of whom have today view themselves as being losers in the deal. Uh, 
And because of technology possibilities today, one of the fundamental problems with this industry can be solved, and that is that healthcare is consumed locally, but it's purchased broadly. And we see the consumerization of health from the delivery of care all the way to the purchase of care as being possible because of technology, and I think it'll fundamentally change it. And tell us a little bit, for those who don't know about, about HICSME, what it, what it provides. And I should say, was anyone in our 2015 Tech Summit at UCLA, um, we actually had one of HICSME's investors all worlds, so, uh, you know, tell us how you've done it and what it is you, you guys do. Well, we, we recognize that uh, economies never work well when there's a third party purchase. And people's behavior in health, and it's been proven over and over again, are going to be much more efficient and there's going to be much more adherence when people believe they own the solution front to back. When people purchase health care financing on their own, and then they have the freedom to select care options of their own, they behave like consumers. And so platforms that don't exist today would, indis would, would basically not need to distinguish whether or not that funding is ultimately coming from your employer, from a government source, or out of your own pocket. And so what we've done is we've created a platform that employers can deploy that give every one of their workers and each one of the dependents of those workers the ability to independently own and select the healthcare um, environment of their choice and be able to own that selection, be financed through their employer, and yet be able to select independently the course of care locally. Uh, so an employer who's got people in 30 or 40 different cities, every one of those people would be shopping local. They'd be sensitive to the options that exist just in that local market where the employer may not otherwise know that if they're headquartered in Chicago, for example. You know, uh, you guys make it look easy, but I was talking with Matt earlier before the program, we were talking about how hard it is, you know, to be a startup in the healthcare arena, and that's not even getting into life sciences or anything like that, where you have biotech, you know, uh, given everything from HIPAA to uh, the state of healthcare payments and, and uh, how things are structured, it is tough, and yet, uh, you know, Techstars decided to get into this area. Uh, tell us some of the lessons you learned from shepherding all these startups through in, in Techstars program. And are, would you advise folks who are thinking about a healthcare startup, don't do it? <laughs> healthcare is different than any other industry where you can just put out an MVP, see if the market likes it, don't just iterate on it, adjust it. Sales cycle for a healthcare tech company is 12 to 18 months, and most health systems uh, don't have the efficiency or risk tolerance to work with an early stage startup that might not be around, or something that could at worst endanger the lives of their patients, or slightly less worse than that, um, lessen the efficiency of their, their staff. And so most health systems will say to any early stage startup in healthcare, come back to me when you've got a couple big name customers that I know and trust, and if it works there, then I'll talk to you. Um, that creates a little bit of a, a learning challenge for a healthcare startup where you don't know if you have product market fit usually until it's too late and you've run out of capital. And so one of the reasons we even did this program in the first place is Cedar sinai fortunately did have the, um, the the tolerance and culture to work and effectively treat their own staff and their facility as a wet lab to help promising healthcare tech startups that didn't necessarily have that referenceability yet um, get their focus, you know, work on the integration, figure out their go-to-market strategy, um, get the feedback from all the people that would be using it, how they would want to use it, figure out whether there's an ROI because a lot of things in healthcare, you would think that it has an ROI, but remember, it's not the patient that's paying for the product. Sometimes it's not even the provider that's paying for the product. It's somebody that's, you know, three degrees removed, and so there needs to be an ROI for the person to use software or hardware. And that's really hard to figure out. Uh, and so our program uh, is, was designed to really work with the most product companies and find that product market fit, uh, help them find it. on sales cycles everywhere else. And most health systems usually don't have unlimited budget for, for technology. Um, so it is an uphill struggle. Um, I think that the companies that are successful, and I mentioned Flatiron recently, and you can see Omada is doing really incredible work right now, starting to, to choke 
efficiencies. Like, like um, Denny said, it's a $3 trillion industry. There's a lot of room for improvement, um, but it's easier said than done. Execution is very challenging in healthcare tech. You mentioned how hard it is for uh, providers to, uh, to take that risk and get involved, and we have to admire that Providence has uh, been doing that with the Providence Ventures Fund, $150 million fund. Uh, it's pretty incredible. I mean, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, if, if there are any aspiring entrepreneurs uh, in, in the audience who'd want to get funded by them, does, does Providence, being such a, a, a giant across the country, uh, rely on, on local leaders to refer the best, most promising startups up to the, the fund managers? How does that work? Well, um, with the Providence Fund, it's a hundred, $150 million venture capital fund. And it's really, we, we know that we cannot change healthcare alone. Although we're a very large system, we have 114,000 caregivers, uh, we're serving seven uh, of the states of Western United States. Uh, we've got to come together with the innovators, the entrepreneurs, and we've got to find ways to partner and, and change, uh, change the paradigm and the, and the things that we're doing um, effectively. So yes, we do encourage um, that we identify resources and, and support. And to your point about using the, the hospital as that, that uh, beta site, it, it's hard for us because we can't do just exactly the things you said. But because we have such large size and scope, we can bring people together and identify resources and align partners. Uh, one example is uh, an N of one, which is the clinical, uh, clinical decision making model that actually helps us with our research and patients. Um, I'll give you my mic here. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, and those, and we, we have brought partners together to make all that work. Um, the other thing that we have in addition to the Providence Fund, I, and I do encourage you to, to look at the website, there's a lot of terrific information on there and how to access the individuals that could be supportive. Um, but we also have the Innovations Institute, which is a part of actually St. Joseph Health, and you may know that St. Joseph Health and Providence Health and Services came together about two years ago. The Innovations Institute is in Newport Beach and is meant to bring uh, entrepreneurs, individuals who are actually in the healthcare setting, identifying ways to improve efficiencies, improve the care that we're providing, and then help create mechanisms that fund and bring those uh, resources to market. So it's pretty exciting, the work that's being done, and because of our size and scale, we can do some of this exciting work. Think about, you know, you look across the country, and I don't know how many of you have consulted U.S. News for their uh, rankings, I'm sure we all did for, for, for college, right? But they also rank health systems, and, and UCLA is ranked amongst the top of the nation. And, you know, you've got to imagine that there's a certain number of innovators that are coming out of the academic side uh, of the institution, but the, the health system itself is very innovative and has a, you know, management style that uh, has been worthy of a, a book about it even. So, uh, could, I don't know uh, which of you would like to jump in, but you talk a little bit about how and if uh, there's any hope for startups to, you know, to interface w with, with the health system or if really all innovation is being driven from within, what do you say? Um, I would say, uh, in my experience, uh, working with uh, young innovators who approach me about uh, various applications that they've come up with or products that have um, applicability to the hospital setting, um, it's, a, it's a difficult road uh, in terms of coming to a big health system as was already alluded to. Um, the quintessentially, the larger the institution, the more risk averse they tend to be. You, you not only deal with you know, risk to patients, but also risk to patients' information even. So a lot of the um, innovation that I see is specifically looking to help doctors with many of their frustrations. And right now, the main frustration is coming to terms with this new product, the electronic medical record, which has tremendous promise, but um, we're not anywhere near where we would like to be in terms of user-friendly uh, interfaces or where it does actually lead to, to uh, improved efficiencies. So. Um, I, you know, I don't want to discourage anybody, but it's certainly um, an area that has tremendous promise in terms of leading to something that will cause significant change and improvements. But um, right now, I think um, we're, um, we're looking to see what our competition are doing. I mentioned you know, Amazon and, 
and uh, Berkshire Hathaway and J.P. Morgan early on in terms of getting into, it was more the health insurance business, but it's a major frustration for employers in non-medical fields to try to make models fit to healthcare, which clearly it doesn't. I think fundamentally the financing of healthcare should change and in the you know, environment that we see today where uh, members of the public and consumers are not willing to put up with the status quo anymore, I think I'm very optimistic that change. Will that happen within the next one to two years? I, I doubt, but certainly within five or more, I'm sure we'll see it. And Apple is also following this model with their own health clinics. It's, it's interesting to see more competition in the industry, I suppose. <laughs> how did you get, uh, how did you get, uh, you know, um, uh, well, you know, before we do that, I want to give you a chance to, to comment as well, actually. Well, you know, as Mike alluded to, we, you know, the UCs are an enormous bureaucracy, obviously, um, state-funded, uh, and, and also with in the UCLA system, you know, we have essentially three uh, core values that we, we have to deal with on pretty much on a daily basis in the health system. One is, obviously, delivery of care. We also have a medical school, so education is an is a enormous part of what we do. But the last part of that, the, 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 of that triad, is research. Um, our research, research portfolio is in the hundreds of millions of dollars and with a lot of NIH grants. So even though it's bureaucratic, I think if you're a young student in that system or even outside that system, you can access it through the research portfolio. The, it's a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, you know, our mathematics departments, our bioinformatics departments, our physics departments often interface with our, our basic science departments in the medical schools like biochemistry or physiology. So there, there are a number of avenues. It is a little bit more difficult, obviously, to access it and to, and to find exactly where your interest may lie. But I think that if you're a young uh, entrepreneurial kind of person, uh, there is a place for you at UCLA, at UCLA Health. Um, because there are a lot of really young, bright minds there that are, that are embedded in, within our research portfolio who aren't necessarily going to go into medicine per se. Denny, I just wanted to ask you, we've heard how hard it is to do all of this. How did you guys do it? How, you know, how did, what's the story of how Kleiner Perkins got involved? Uh, you know, uh, share, share some hope with all of us. And if any of you do have the questions, I want to give a chance as well. Raise your hand. We'll get to you shortly. You know, I'll say this. Um, there's exciting... Um, uses of technology all through um, our economy. And, and we just saw this super interesting presentation on gaming. And it's created a notion that technology is about, all about uh, consumer delight and excitement. There are um, industries that don't create delight. And healthcare is one. We create safety and security and hope. And so it's a very, very different um, personal consumer technology challenge. And yet, you know, as I said before, it's probably the most broken industry top to bottom. We probably have uh, some of the greatest potential in this country to solve this problem, both in terms of how um, the process of care is changing over time and also the possibilities of technology. The problem is for most Americans, this is a very negative experience top to bottom, beginning to end. And so what, you know, as entrepreneurs, you got to get, you sort of, you know, tighten your belt a bit. This is a massive opportunity because it is so big and it is so broken, and there are going to be such enormous, enormous breakthroughs. But they're not going to come because you're going to have an exciting mobile app. They're going to come because you solve real problems, deploying technology in very unique and practical ways. And that's really where we got challenged, and that's why a company as big as Kleiner Perkins decided to invest in us. Uh, because I think we weren't living in a club. We were, we were living in the world of practical challenges and a lot of pain with consumers and with their employers. If you do have a question, raise your hand, but I've got one right now burning at me. You know, it's obviously something you can't avoid with the future of healthcare as a topic. I mean, you mentioned what an opportunity we have in this country. At the same time, maybe some of the opportunity can't be addressed without structural changes. Uh, you know, we're thinking that on the national level, on a state level as well. I mean, what is uh, the forecast here from the panel on, on those fronts? Do you see big changes ahead, uh, state or, or nationally? Uh, or do you think uh, we're just going to kind of keep puttering along uh, as they are? This has been a very doom and gloomy, very negative panel. So I think I'm going to sort of 
pull from the, my portfolio and share with you some of the like really cutting edge stuff that's actually working. They're finding like product market fit. They're raising capital, uh, and it's a, you're really promising. And you know, to, to build on last conversation around virtual reality, we have a virtual reality company based right here in Los Angeles called Applied VR uh, that's done clinical trials around using virtual reality to actually reduce pain and stress and anxiety before, during, and after surgeries. And they're showing 25 to 50 percent reductions in pain. They're literally women um, strapping these on during labor and foregoing a lot of pain medications. And in this world where the opioid crisis is one of the biggest challenges we're facing as a society, anything we can use to use technology to reduce our reliance on opioids is amazing. And so they're finding lots and lots of really great applications of virtual, virtual reality. We have another company in Pasadena that's using machine learning to analyze all of that gobbledygook in the electronic med med medical record uh, and looks at all the unstructured text and helps find the best clinical trial for every patient. Um, there's enormous opportunities and innovation in, pharmace in the pharmaceutical industry, partnering with the provider industry and using technology to help, to help fuel and accelerate the path of, of drugs to market and give people better, um, better treatments. Um, we have another company that's using uh, devices to allow you at, from the comfort of your own home with no pain, just press a button, put it on your upper arm, and extracts blood so you don't need to go into the doctor's office for phlebotomy. And you know, think about the, the pediatric use cases and not having to give your kid uh, intravenous blood draw. I mean, there's so many cool technologies, and they are working, and it just takes patience. You actually have to solve a problem that there's an ROI tied to, show that it works, and there will be money, but you know, there's no quick fix with a little mobile app that's going to make you billions of dollars overnight. Like, you actually have to do the work. Well, you know, I actually like your answer. Forget the whole doom and gloom about the uh, healthcare reform question. You know, share a little anecdote, if you could, as we close out the panel, about what, what you're doing, uh, innovation within, within UCLA, within Providence, you know, uh, telehealth, virtual medicine, what, whatever it might be. So I, I think um, one of the things that we're doing, it's uh, quite low tech. It's really sort of trying to get back to the physician-patient relationship. One thing in technology that is, uh, that is lost is being um, at your doctor's office and they're sitting there clicking on a computer, typing your words like a scribe and not really paying much attention to what you're saying. So um, at UCLA, I think we're, we're making a name for trying to make technology work and retaining the human touch of the physician-patient relationship in different ways. So I know we're short on time, so I'll... Um, from the Providence side, we, we're, we're really excited about where the future is. We, we're pretty uh, bullish on the things that are going to happen in the, the coming years. Uh, I will tell you, we have an entire division um, dedicated to telehealth services. And in that division, we have more than 40 offerings, whether it be telestroke or telepsych or um, teletranslation. I mean, there's a variety of resources that are being made available to rural settings and to urban settings where it makes sense. Um, but I will tell you, to your point about uh, advocacy and some of the legislative issues, is that there are changes that are needed. And around telehealth services, as an example, we believe that it's something that will help to increase accessibility for all those who need care. Uh, and so we're a part of a statewide health uh, coalition on telehealth. And you'll see changes start to happen around that, which will better enable those technologies. But I do agree with you. It is, it's personal. It's, it's, we need to be at the local level providing that compassionate care that is so critical to the expectations that we all have. But these digitally enabled services are going to advance the care we're providing. As we look at caregiver uh, engagement and having them enabled, looking at platforms that start to connect all of those things around the health, the electronic health record, around the things that are happening within the provider offices, when we start to see connectivity in all of those services, we're going to start to see the efficiency that we, we all want to see in healthcare. Uh, I'm actually optimistic about where the country is going to go. Uh, I think ultimately, I think voters will vote for representatives that are going to uh, deliver on health care that's, that's more nationalized. I think uh, as you look in California, you'll see that the most patients get their care and keep their care within a system, whether it's a Kaiser system or Providence system or UCLA, and that they usually stay within that system for the life of, of, of that plan for the most life. Um, 
I think we're going to move towards uh, at least a, an option for a single payer, uh, a Medicare for all, uh, for want of a better term, that's going to be more nationalized. Um, you know, I personally welcome that. I think that we as an industrial nation should be able to, to give affordable care across the, uh, across the country and, and not uh, have it be sporadic in, in some of the states as it is now. Um, so my, my feeling is that you know we're gonna we're preparing for that. that we're prepared for any of the options that occur on a national level. Uh, I think we'll be ready for it, as I think you know Providence system and Kaiser system will be. But I, I do think that that's going to happen probably within the next decade. I would just say that the uh, the, the kind of natural forces causing consolidation among uh, systems of care that are resulting in, just as you said, um, many much more organized systems locally throughout the United States will rationalize um, how care is delivered and, uh, and will also uh, provide the ability to deploy all the kinds of technology that's being talked about here. It's very difficult to do it when you've got a system as fragmented as ours has been over the last 20 years. I see natural economic forces of consolidation solving that. Certainly an exciting and important industry, a lot of challenges, but it's challenges that are worth solving and we're so grateful to have our great panel today. Why don't you give them a big thank you. Now we're going to get back to a little more fun. <laughs> we're going to go for a chance to reflect on the future of entertainment, of gaming, and of music. And I'd like to welcome up to the stage our panel here as we explore these exciting areas, expand upon the keynote earlier, and look at uh, everything from esports to music to uh, public television to autonomous vehicle, virtual reality. You'll hear a lot of interesting things in this panel. So uh, I'd like to welcome the panelists to take the stage here, and we'll jump right in as we explore a topic which I know is, is keen to all of us, even if we're not in the industry, it's something we as consumers care a great deal about. So welcome, thank you all very much. So grateful. You know, I just want to uh, just want to thank everyone for, uh, for joining us today. We're so grateful. I know uh, you got the, the prize for the speaker flown in the furthest here from the East Coast. Thank you. Uh, glad the Oscars provided a chance to have you in town. Um, I'd like to, you know, just start things off with uh, asking the audience here, who here has uh, a sense of eSports? Raise your hand. Any eSports fans? I mean, quite a number, I love it. And for the rest of you, you may have heard about it. You may not know exactly what it is, but it is enormous, enormous industry that is deal uh, across the world. So we're very honored to have uh, the, the CEO, newly promoted CEO of ESL uh, with us, uh, the biggest player in esports, uh, which is based here in Burbank. And uh, Yvette, will you just tell uh, those of us in the audience who aren't familiar with, with esports, A, what it is, and what, what you, you guys do? So hi, my name is Yvette. As he said, I'm the CEO of North America for ESL, which stands for Esports League. ESL is the largest esports company in the world. We actually have been around for 18 years doing competitive video games. So it's very simple. It's amateur to professional video game competitions. So similar to basketball or baseball, it's just video games. Uh, in our 18 years, we've given away $20 million of prize money. Uh, we run everything from entry-level online competitions for amateurs all the way to professional stadium events. I just came back from Poland to our largest event, Counter-Strike event. We had 75,000 people in the stadium watching, uh, watching uh, two teams play Counter-Strike um, against each other, which is a, a team-based uh, shooter game. Um, so that is, that's in a nutshell what it is, and just to give you a little bit of context of why we're so excited about it, there are 2.6 billion gamers in the world, people who play video games. There's about 150,000, I'm sorry, 150 million we consider esports enthusiasts, those are people who play or are uh, highly engaged watchers, and another 125 million people who are casual watchers. So it's, it's a big industry, it will we'll generate about 1.5 billion dollars in revenue this year as, a, as an industry. 
so grateful to have ESL North America be here in Burbank. So uh, it's all happening here, folks. You know, uh, raise your hand if you, like me, grew up watching PBS. All right. Wonderful. And of course, still watch it today. I just was watching uh, PBS app, my Apple TV, Rick Steves, uh, just this past weekend. Uh, relax. Uh, I'm, you've done a lot to make my life for the better. And I want to ask you, Ira, uh, uh, Ira is the Chief Digital and Marketing Officer for uh, for PBS nationally, uh, how you've done, you know, this is an industry, uh, we've seen so much innovation from, on the, uh, in the private sector, we saw Ted uh, telling us what he's doing, but I have a friend who works at NPR as a strategist, and, you know, in public broadcasting, sometimes you have board leadership where the interests are with the stations individually, and they're not always wanting to have centralized, you know, digital offerings, which are drawing people away from broadcast and everything. And yet, you know, it's a pretty snazzy PBS app on the iPad, on the Apple TV and beyond. Uh, you came from the private sector world, from, from, from Marvel and, and beyond uh, out here. Tell us why you decided to make the jump and, and how you brought that private sector magic to PBS. Um, <clears throat> well, um, after spending many years in Hollywood, um, I decided to uh, give a little bit back and to uh, go work at PBS, it was about four years ago, and it was really about um, helping public media figure out the digital transformation that was coming, and I'd done it in film, and I'd done it in, in uh, publishing with Marvel and digital comics and stuff, and so I just kind of saw it as a challenge. So for PBS, the, the vision I laid out in the strategy was for us to focus on really three things. First and foremost, having the best consumer experience possible across all of our digital platforms. Because if we don't have that best experience, consumers have so many choices, you're gonna go somewhere else. And we have to do that first and foremost. Second is focusing on the individual stations. As you mentioned, public media is actually a organization of independent stations. And each station is different. We have a saying that if you've been the one public media station, you've actually been the one public media station. It's kind of every college different than college tours of your kids, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and stations have different levels of capability, they have different backgrounds, some are backed by the state, some are backed by a local university, some are independent ventures. And so the second thing being focused on station branding, because the model for public media is independent uh, dues and um, through stations. So when you hear about uh, the president um, threatening to cut our funding, it's actually the funding that goes to the Corporation of Public Broadcasting, which is an independent corporation that funds PBS stations, NPR stations, and other independent public media stations. And so for us, when the money from Corporation of Public Broadcasting actually goes to a local station, depending on the size of the market, it might be 30% of their budget, it might be 5% of their budget. But the rest of that budget is actually made up of viewers like you, about 50% of an average station's budget. So it's critical in the digital world where you have this displacement that you tie a station and their branding back to the experience. So whenever you into a PBS app or PBS website or what have you, you notice I kind of force you to localize to your station. And there's a donate button. That's a conscious effort because the donation has to flow to the station and then they in turn pay dues back. And then the third thing we're focused on is revenue, uh, revenue for the station. So by focusing on those three things and providing solutions to stations that work at scale, we've had a lot of success in stations picking up that and moving forward. And you've actually put into place a special premium level of PBS content for donors of $5 a month or more, right? Tell us about that. Uh, so about a year or so ago, we launched a product called uh, Passport. And it was a conscious effort uh, for stations not to do a like HBO Go on a national level, but a local station. So here it would be PBS SoCal Passport here in San Francisco, KQED Passport, WIDA, what have you. And by building a platform level of a membership benefit, 
So if you are a member, you get access to a much larger library of our video content. So of course, being public media, first and foremost, we're serving the public with free content. There's thousands of hours for free. But say you want to see Victoria season one because you missed seeing it and you're seeing Victoria season two right now. Um, if you're a member, you can go back. And what has happened was through these digital platforms, people are discovering more content and they come across content that's in the passport uh, window and they're signing up. So what we've seen in the last year, we've seen about $20 million of new revenue uh, come into the system. We've seen um, uh, additional new members and their average age is about 20 years younger than your typical PBS donor that's still watching the pledge drive, believe it or not. Um, and so the system, it's also become the number one new source for new members for uh, most stations. So that's really kind of helping stations as scale uh, become, uh, I would call it digital or multi-platform uh, fundraising and development. I love it. So the board must love you and the station managers must love you. You've managed to find a way to make this thing which they thought was against their interests, the digitalization in their interests. Pretty cool. Um, and also pretty cool is the stuff that, that Pam is working on at Warner Brothers. Uh, how many of you were here uh, at our Burbank Tech Talks event with Thomas Gawecki, Warner Brothers Chief Digital Officer? All right. So you got a little bit of, of a sense of, of where things are going from his perspective. Some of you may have heard about a really cool announcement Warner Brothers did uh, in partnership with Intel uh, having to do with autonomous vehicles. And I'd like to just turn things over to you, Pam. Tell us uh, your background and give us a little hint of that uh, announcement that you did with Intel as well. I'm in the digital initiatives group at Warner Brothers. So what we do is we look at uh, new opportunities for distribution and consumption for consumers. Um, one of our big projects, which David just alluded to, is autonomous cars. Um, how many of you have been in an autonomous vehicle? Okay, a handful. I only went on my first ride in uh, January. We announced at the end of November that in partnership with Intel, we are taking one of their autonomous vehicles and putting content into that vehicle so we can explore how consumers will utilize all that free time that they're gonna have um, when they're in that car. Uh, we know that the car is gonna change how it looks, um, maybe on the outside, but certainly on the inside. You no longer have to have four or five seats facing forward. You can rearrange the seating, the screens, and we can utilize everything from streaming content to virtual and augmented reality. Um, so we're really interested in how that evolves uh, going forward. And ladies and gentlemen, we also have a true worldwide uh, giant here from the music industry. Uh, and I, I'm going to turn over things. Tell us a little bit how you went from being a DJ to uh, now having a worldwide program uh, around the world, being actually, no matter, an events uh, uh, guy as well. Uh, how you evolved your career. I guess being in broadcasting, I need a microphone that works. Um, well, I've always had a passion for music, so that's been the main driver, and also a love for radio, because radio knows how to communicate sound better than anybody when it comes to that emotional connection with the audience. So having a love for music and radio uh, were the two sort of feet I needed to get into the music business, and for the past 35 years, that relationship has evolved into really understanding music place in the, in the world when it comes to pretty much every touch point where music is heard, seen, interacted, and experienced. So whether it's a traditional business, live technology, synchronization for film, TV, brands, gaming, the live experience, the festival experience, the club experience, to uh, you know the mobile and digital run that we're in right now. So music has a very exciting path forward. I think the next five years, we're expecting to see hundreds of billions of dollars of new growth in the music sector across all areas. So 
That covers, as I said, digital, traditional, live, synchronization. Um, and of course, you know, with new emerging markets, such as Southeast Asia, Asia, South America, Africa, you're going to see an even broader growth. So where I stand with a &R Worldwide, our core focus is content discovery, development, and then bring it to the industry and the market. So over the years, we've worked with a lot of great artists very early on before they were signed, artists such as Coldplay, Adele, Teng Teng's, LMFAO, and my company's philosophy is really that music is an emotion, and how do we correlate that emotional connection to both business platforms and the consumer? You know, um, how many people in the audience know what a &R stands for in the industry? Uh, maybe some aspiring musicians or, or already musicians uh, out there uh, who do know artists from repertoire. Tell us, though, uh, how it's evolved. A lot of a lot of those departments went away. I guess they all hire you as a consultant instead. But but how that role of discovering new musicians, you know, has evolved uh, across your career now. Well, look, uh, A and R for us stands for three things. So certainly, artists and repertoire, artists and relationships. How do we take the art and take to the right relationships? And then thirdly, artists and revenue. How do we monetize that relationship and the art? So it's really those sort of three areas and. Before the business became globalized, obviously the music industry went through a, late, a very tumultuous period way before the gaming and film and TV business. So we learned a lot of mistakes, but prior to starting a and Worldwide, I always had a, gl a global viewpoint. My philosophy was you've got to act local, think global, and the world of technology really brought us back to the beginning of humanity because prior to the continent splitting up, we were one giant continent known as Pangaea. And so my belief was always that music, you know, is instilled in our DNA. We're all emotional beings, and music, for the most part, appeals to over 90% of the world's population. There's some, some sort of connection to music to 90% of the world's population, which is astronomical. And so for me, you know, music doesn't have any boundaries. Because it's an emotion, it can connect anywhere. So whether you sing in English, in Hindi, or in Spanish, if there's a rhythm, if there's a connection, it can work. And so, before we started getting into the digital age, a and Worldwide helped the industry as a whole to understand what music at its core really is. And so as technology has evolved, the industry has sort of come around now to realize, you know what, we can't geographically hinder music's ability, it really is a, a global form of communication and so as the world has evolved in technology, the business of music has really thrived because there really are no barriers except for one's imagination. You know, uh, that's awesome and you know, I've <laughs> got some fans here. Um, you know, I just want to say, Pam's not the only one whose company has partnered with Intel. Nevada also, uh, on the esports side, I know you guys uh, work with them but uh, in a big way, um, but tell us what's next. You know, you have these incredible, you know, I mean, 70, what was it, 70, 75,000 people, you know, in these uh, arenas around the world and watch some of the, the videos that they have on the SO website. If you don't know about eSports, uh, part, of, part of it is the awesome music the videos have, but part of it's the amazing production values of their events, the incredible excitement of people around the world coming to see the best in the world. Uh, just like if you're a basketball fan, you know, or a baseball fan, best in this field. But what's next, you know, uh, for those of us who aren't in uh, eSports world, take us in what, you know, you're focusing on this year in 2018 and how you're going to drive innovation. Sure. So there's a couple of uh, things, one of them very much related to why we're in Burbank, which is that the convergence of esports and just traditional entertainment is happening very, very quickly. Uh, we think of, you know, our, our fans and viewers are digital natives. They're 14 to 24 year old men generally, although it's more and more women. These are uh, individuals who do not watch a lot of tele traditional linear television. So what we're seeing is that, that we are having to um, 
as they're aging, we're having to reach them and repackage what we do in different ways, and, and now looking at the forms of what's happened, what's come before in entertainment and traditional media. So, uh, so we're doing a lot now working with traditional studios like Hulu, like Disney, like Netflix, uh, to figure out how we package our, our tournaments and our competitions to actually be watched in different formats and different ways, reality, TV, talk shows, etc. Um, so that's one of the trends that we're seeing, is, is that we, our, our work is converging with traditional entertainment. The second thing is obviously the advancement of technology. Uh, we do a lot of work with companies like Oculus for uh, virtual reality. So many, many of our tournaments can now be watched uh, and experienced from home as if you are there. Um, and also there's games that are being developed in virtual reality. Um, so that's another trend that we're going to see a lot of. Um, and the last one I would say is that we are starting to see an expansion beyond the traditional young kind of geeky male stereotype into more women and more, and more people of different ages and different backgrounds. So we take a lot of pride in the fact that we are a leader in uh, exclusivity and diversity in, in esports. In fact, we just, uh, we just brought esports to the Olympics uh, in Korea for the first time as an exhibition Tell and we had that. we had a, a woman uh, win uh, a Starcraft tournament so uh, very excited about that um, and you're seeing uh, you're seeing some of that um, also happening here the overwatch league here in Burbank just added a female to one of its teams so finally sort of seeing some of those doors opening how you know how do we that's awesome um, you know how do we change beyond the sports the culture uh, sometimes you know, even those of us who aren't uh, don't have the time, and I used to play Warcraft as a kid growing up until the sun came up. I, I love gaming. How do we change some of the dynamics, though, the culture, you know, that makes it kind of tough uh, for for women uh, and, frankly, others too who don't like some of the some of the uh, rougher sides of, of gaming? Do you think are we going to change that? Are we going to make it more welcoming for folks to be able to cross the chasm and get more uh, folks in uh, beyond the hardcore folks, or is it kind of tough? To, I think you asked two questions there. One is sort of how do we change the environment and, and what you're referring to, for those of you who don't play or don't, um, is that these uh, gaming communities are very vocal and very active and it can be, because it's a, not, a lot of it is anonymous behind their gamer tags, there can be a lot of nastiness in the way they speak to one another, um, which can make it very uh, aggressive for an environment for women or people of color or others who participate. And so one of the things we do at ESL is we have uh, just a very open, direct um, standard and, of rules of how people can talk to each other during our play. Um, and so what we say is, look, if you are not speaking correctly to one another, if you're creating an aggressive environment for someone, you are out, you are kicked out. Um, and we enforce that with us and, and the people that, and we work with other publishers and other uh, tournament operators to enforce that in their tournament. So that's number one. The other thing is how do you get more people involved and expand it? To me, it's very simple. I talk to, as a woman, I talk to a lot of women uh, about how do I get more of them into the space. And one of the things they'll say is, look, it's all about getting little girls to play. At the end of the day, it's all about letting little girls uh, feel like this is just as okay for them to spend 10 hours playing a, sh you know, a shooter game or a, or a fighter game as it is for, their, uh, for boys. And I know my daughter is 11 years old. I just have her, just, I exposed her to Street Fighter, uh, which, is a, <laughs> which is a fighter game. There's, a fe there's female characters in there that are just as badass as the male characters, and she is loving it. Um, so I think it's all about sort of encouraging our girls to play, and then the ones that are really good and that becomes their passion, letting them go ahead and train and, and move into the professional ranks, just like any other sport. Um, and I want to switch gears to PBS again and, and ask you, you know, without putting you on the spot too much and sharing anything that your board would want you to, uh, what's next for PBS, aside from the funding uncertainties and all of that? I know that's, uh, that's something um, in all of our minds, but but on the digital side, you know, um, can you give us any hint of... Uh, um, I'm, I'm happy to. Actually, what's nice about PBS, instead of being corporate America, I can share pretty much anything. Um, but first, I do want to say, I have a 13-year-old daughter, big Overwatch player. I know that's not your league, but, you know, every night with her older brother, who's 17, they're talking about the different leagues, different players, surprise who's playing what. Esports is so big. I don't think anyone has any true imagination of how big it is. I'm always trying to think for PBS, okay, what does that mean for PBS? Does that mean that we should do a content show? Should we do something with the digital kids? And so, you know, thinking about that sort of things. But other... Uh, right. Partnership uh, sounds right here. <laughs> um, but, you know, things we have, um, you know, I'm very focused on uh, voice and voice activation and watching what's happening in voice and discovery of content. 
um, and how that plays out for uh, finding your shows. Um, also, thinking about um, creating content for different digital platforms. We have a, uh, on YouTube, we have a channel called PBS Digital Studios. It averages about 40 million views uh, a month. We've crossed 1 billion lifetime views already. Um, and that's really about pushing stations, as well as PBS, to think differently of creating content. So what does it mean for public media content on these platforms? And if you think about PBS, which is approaching its 50th anniversary, back then you had Mr. Rogers and Julia Childs, you had these innovators who came across this technology called TV and they were thinking about, okay, what kind of content can we make? And so part of that, part of my job is, you know, pushing PBS to think about creating content for these different kind of platforms, creating content for gaming platforms, etc. Other things um, that we're working on, um, last year we launched uh, a kids 24-7 uh, channel over the air um, because we knew that kids, especially those in underserved communities, were mostly watching TV in the evening when we weren't on the air. And so through a multicast network, we launched the kids channel, which has helped a ton. And we've also launched, uh, at the same time, a live video stream of that same channel. And just a month ago, we interacted our games components. So as you're watching a show from, say, Peg and Cat or Odd Squad, and then they're talking about a math problem, well, the game that's related to that and helping children understand that math problem will then pop up on the screen. Because we know that when children are engaged in the games, as well as the video content, they actually absorb the uh, educational material better. And future things for us is um, figuring out uh, what it means for PBS on skinny bundle packages. And how do we help local stations get on those packages when a lot of their content that they have that isn't from PBS during the day isn't cleared for live streaming. So there's a lot of this, those sort of things that we're focused on, but it's really always focusing on meeting the consumer, helping stations get that branding, and then driving revenue. Well, you know, NPR has an NPR West out here in Southern California. I think you need to open up a PBS West in Burbank here to develop some of that further. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we'll see that. Uh, I could go on and on with questions here. I, we're starting to run out of time. I want to make sure we involve the audience. If you have a burning question here, come right up here. I'll give the mic to you and so you can ask our panel. And let us know if you have one, someone in particular it's to address to or uh, to the whole panel. Hi guys, my name is Gideon. Uh, the question is about uh, to everybody on the panel, and I'm sure everybody will find their own angle, about how artificial intelligence is going to change what you're doing today. And we're going to see tomorrow artificial intelligence assisted players on ESL, how you're going to address it on PBS, uh, you know, and, and what are we talking about music? The, the, out there, a lot of talk that we'll have tomorrow artificial intelligence writing music, conducting music, performing music. There's a company out there called Zenf, that you're probably familiar, who does digital, you know, re remaking, and you can ask, you know, uh, somebody does Bach in Britney Spears' voice. Hopefully you don't replace Judy Woodruff with AI, though. <laughs> well, AI is, we're, we're looking at AI a lot, um, for a lot of different things. Um, everything from storytelling, to analyzing images for um, you know, emotional intelligence to gauge um, the emotion of characters or an audience to influence the story. We can use those images for marketing. Obviously, if we can scan images and content for um, you know, things like you know, um, characters or location or objects, we can use that for detailing everything and using that in the future for other storytelling or marketing or selling images or that sort of thing. It's almost never ending what you can do um, and we're, we're just beginning to explore all of those. I agree with you. I think it's just an extension of the experience and you're going to continue to see AI, VR become a part of the music experience as you do with film, gaming and everything else. So uh, it's, it's just an extension of what that's an end result for the
consumer is all about. So I think we'll see a lot of exciting new technology continue to emerge and evolve and make the experience better and more engaging each, uh, you know, as we sort of go through each wave of new technology, technology revolution and evolution. Do I see a question up here? Uh, here we go. Hi, I'm Monica. I have an English accent, just so you know. <laughs> Um, so I actually worked in gaming, so I used to do stuff for Konami um, and I did a lot of marketing, so we launched PES, Pro Evolution Soccer, um, so I was kind of in the gaming world um, in a marketing sense and I also used to work at the BBC, um, so I know a lot about the old PBS and NPR um, and I just wondered, um, I've just turned 30, so well I'm turning 37 this year and I think a lot of women in the room will be able to see this glass ceiling that exists and have this reality of having to smash through it. Um, I recently left a job um, that was not serving me on all levels because of this glass ceiling that we all learnt about at college or at school. Um, and I just wanted to maybe ask all of your advice as um, a professional who's been working in the industry in different areas, um, how do you see the role from the, men, the, male, the male point of view and the female point of view of how we break through those barriers because I'm at a point where I'm looking at it and I don't necessarily want to smash glass. That's a Marvel movie, right? Well, ESL is a female CEO, PBS is a female CEO. <laughs> um, wow, that's, that's a big question. We should talk after. <laughs> oh, really. Um, so I would say, look, I, I, um, I'm a female CEO in an eSports company. I'm the only woman on the global management team. Um, I will tell you that from my perspective, that has um, mostly to do with the fact that I have never thought of myself as a woman in a male workplace. I think of myself as a person in the workplace. I also, I think, have very much approached, I'm, I'm a very curious person, I like challenges. I came to esports, it intimidated the hell out of me because I'd never played, I didn't know gaming, but I approached it very much with the how can I learn and, 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 and how can I be taught and how can I respect and then what can I bring? And I think what, uh, what I have found absolutely without question is that there are definitely moments that you get these, uh, I just had somebody ask me the other day how I can do my job and be a mom. As if, do they ever ask men that? Does a man ever get that question? How can you do your job? Um, so you get these moments and you just, for me, I just kind of let them go and go, you know, I'm gonna show them by, by the work I do. And it, it's worked out for me. I now have a, my leadership team, three out of my four VPs are women. Not because they're women, but because they happen to have become the best people and the people that approach this and didn't let themselves get scared off. So I would say that would be my first advice, is, is kind of keep, keep moving even when you hit the barriers. Well, this is probably an impossible answer from a man. But, um, you know, I, I have uh, two daughters. I work for a female CEO, Paula Kerger. She's been CEO of PBS now 12 years. Um, what my experience coming from uh, uh, what do you call it, private sector media versus public. Public media is way more diverse. It just is. And it's, a, it's part of the mission, it's part of who we are. And if you were to look at the PBS senior management team, um, I think there are more women than men, actually, and people of color and um, everything. And if you were to look at stations, you see the same thing. And there's a conscious effort in the system for more station general managers of being women. Um, so I guess, you know, my advice that I would give my own daughter is I, you know, I would look towards businesses and groups that are already making that progress so that you don't have to do all the hard work, that at least there's someone starting. And even at PBS, we have a separate grouping for just women executives where they get together at our different conferences. Um, and it's those sort of things that I would look for, and that's what I would I tell my own daughter who's about to enter the workforce. One thing I wanted to add was uh, I was I, I've only been at Warner Brothers a little over six months, and I was so pleasantly surprised being in Warner Brothers technology. The number of women and women leaders. Our CTO was a woman. I'm leading a, as a woman a car project which obviously is a very traditionally male-dominated area. And not only am I leading it from the Warner Brothers side, on the Intel side, it is also being led by a woman, um, which I love. Um, so certainly, as Ira said, 
try to get into places where it's a lot easier. I recently came from somewhere where it was literally almost impossible as a woman to succeed. And it's been wonderful and you know, not even really what I expected. So being able to surround yourself and finding women, women around you to promote women, because I think you don't always get that. Um, but I, I've been very fortunate in my experience. Well, to uh, add to your sentiments, you know, the, the most inspiring person in my life to help me follow my passion and dreams has been a woman. It's my mom. She supported me from the very beginning. And, uh, you know, so on a personal level, women have always been a big part of my life. My mom, my grandmother, they raised me. My dad worked really hard too, but she was one that was there emotionally for me all the time. Uh, like you, I also have uh, a daughter, but I also have a son. And my wife and my philosophy is that we treat them both equally. And we tell them that you've got to work hard, you've got to push yourself, no one's going to do it for you. So whether you're a guy or a girl, you have to work just as hard. And that's sort of our approach is no one should be treating either one of you better than the other. We don't. My, parent, my, my wife and I treat them both the exact same way. And we've allowed them to evolve and grow as human beings. And ironically, my daughter, physically, is probably a lot tougher. She's going on to a fourth degree black belt, and she can need to kick my ass and my son's ass. So physically, she's a dominant one in the household. And uh, with my work, even though I'm now independent, prior to starting my company, I worked at Live Nation Clear Channel Radio. Uh, <clears throat> even though I have more guys working on my team, my boss, is my wife and so <laughs> it's not always about the quantity it's about the quality right and behind every great man from my personal experience is a greater woman so I just say treat everybody equally but just make sure that uh, you know you push yourself too you can't let anybody else hinder you from your hopes and dreams well that that last line there don't let anyone else hinder you from your hopes and dreams folks we are out of time but how about a big thank you to our panel